Hey everyone, hope you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel is Finding Value. Uh, today we're going to go through Twitter like we normally do. I'll share my opinions uh, as we go through it. It'll generally be related to three topics, wealth building, financial topics, and or commodities, because that's what I'm interested in. Uh, well, that's kind of the stuff I focus on in my life anyway, but commodities is where the value's at. Wealth building is something I'm definitely interested in, uh, basically to become more resilient uh, in life. And then, uh, yeah, financial topics that just covers the whole the whole thing, the umbrella. So let's dive in. Let's see what's going on in the market, and I'll share my opinions as we go through it. If you want to follow me, it's at Finding Underscore Finance. And if you want to join our community, uh, get more of my opinions on setting up portfolios. And I can't help you. You can see what I'm doing, and I share what I'm doing. I can't be a, quote, advisor, but I do talk about how I value companies, what I look for cash flows, what looks like good deals uh, in the markets. And then you can see what I'm doing uh, with my portfolio and uh, the, the way I'm positioning uh, the, the portfolio. So coming on down, we've got Douglas here, an interviewer. And guys, I've been asked, that, I've been asked this question a few times. The interviewer is, where do you see yourself in five years? <clears throat> Me, I'd say my biggest weakness is listening. <laughs> Um, I, why would you say that? Um, you know, what I what I would answer is, uh, given where I'm at in my stage, is, you know, <clears throat> I haven't been able to accurately predict where I would live, what job I would hold uh, in, in a five-year time span. So I kind of live my life like water. I just kind of take the path of least resistance and where I think it's the best fit. And if something's not a good fit, I'm not gonna force myself to hold a certain title, to make a certain amount of money. Um, none of that really matters to me. Uh, I guess what, what I want in my life is I want something where I'm working for, if I'm working for someone else, I want them to be a good boss. I want them to treat me well. I want them to look out for me. I, I want us to be truthful to each other. You know, those are the things that matter to me. This question here doesn't really dig into any of those things. Um, it's kind of, it's all self, you know, like, like what do you, where do you see yourself in five years? I, I don't know. Uh, and that's what I like about my life is I don't know where I'm going to see myself in five years. But one thing I do do is how do I make myself more resilient? And in five years, what I want to measure myself against is I want to be far more resilient in five years than I am today. So <clears throat> that's not a good answer for maybe a question that is at a large corporation asking about your, your incentives to move up in the company or something like that. But my life, I want to become more resilient with time. Resiliency lies in multiple streams of income, in, in setting up dividend income from companies, um, having multiple companies paying you dividends. Um, maybe it's having multiple streams of income that you're working for. Maybe it's uh, another stream through real estate investing where you uh, have more cash flow from that. That is what I see as resiliency. So that's what I want to build. I want to build resiliency and, and options and freedom into my life. So where do I see my, myself in five years? Well, hopefully I'm not working for someone else. Um, hopefully I am becoming more resilient and hopefully I am doing things that I enjoy in my life uh, ever greater than what I'm doing today. So that, that's, that's what I would say. And I know that's kind of a longer, bigger picture view, but you know, why cap it at five years? I'm getting tight on the 15 million heading into power hour, hour. That must be 15 minutes. This is the SPY and this is the QQQ squeezing into a corner. Um, obviously, we've identified this uh, on our daily uh, updates. And this looks pretty interesting. <laughs> a lot of the times on a rising wedge, they, they break to the downside. And with the valuations where they're at, I am nowhere near these things. 
And <clears throat> I know Jeff Bezos has been uh, offloading a lot of stock lately. Uh, a lot of insiders have been doing that, uh, not just Jeff. But uh, this doesn't look all that great. It, it very well could break to the downside, and, and we'll find out uh, over the next few trading sessions which way this thing breaks. Um, this is Warren Buffett, Uncle Warren. So Occidental, thanks for the conviction. Follow smart money with the insider actions indicator is what this person talks about. But we've got a downtrend line that's broken to the upside in a lot of these oil and natural gas companies. Now, Oxy is a pretty big company. That's the one that Warren's going into probably because of liquidity reasons, and he's got a lot of money to invest. But there's a lot of small mid-cap producers that look very good. Uh, that are breaking to the upside, and that's kind of where I like uh, to dabble. It's not small enough where it gets too risky. It's where you get all the leverage to the upside, balancing what I think is not much more risk uh, from the big boys. So they've got infrastructure in place, things are set up, uh, and this is good to see that Warren is positioning much like I would be. Coming on down, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, uh, they dumped about 10 million Apple shares during the first quarter, or during the last quarter. So Berkshire Hathaway once again keeps new stock purchases secret, trims giant Apple stake. He must be seeing this uh, going on. But he's also uh, buying into Chevron and Occidental, the oil companies. Come on down. This is Jeffrey Bezos has sold another two billion of Amazon stock. This brings his February 2024 total to six billion of Amazon stock sales. Um, I will say this, guys. Jeffrey Bezos is pretty good at market timing. He is pretty good. Um, and a lot of these insiders, they're very good. They're very good at what they do. That sells stocks at tops. Uh, this is Matt Gas Supply, and the supply has been ripping to the upside. This is the cold, the cold weather shutdown kind of streak, and then it continues to be quite robust. Now we we need natural gas supply to be robust, as we've got a lot of LNG terminals coming online, quarter two and onward, uh, for America and Canada. So we're in this weird situation where we have to kind of ramp production. Uh, even though inventories are above the five-year average, and even if we've got warm weather, um, we've got a lot of LNG terminal growth ahead of us and a lot of power burn growth. So although supply is increasing, our demand is also uh, at record highs. Uh, here's Warren Pies on crude oil. It says, tracking the typical technical and positioning signal path well. Not an uber bullish backdrop, but these signals are some of the most reliable that we track. It's a 66% win rate. See the quote uh, tweet. So oil's average path on the three months following technical and positioning buy signal plus 15%. Current signal tracking historic patterns would target a mid 80s by end of quarter one, which is not that far away. It's about you know, a little over a month away, a month and a half. So. That, that's what his opinions are. Uh, this is, is NVIDIA a bubble or no bubble? Be careful. You can prove anything by overlying charts, depending on where you start the chart. And what I'm going to say is it is in a bubble, and you don't need to look at charts. Charts are just the herd creating a pattern. What you need to also work into this into not just using charts, but what's behind it is, well, what are the valuations? What are the valuations of, of NVIDIA or Cisco? And is today a good time to buy it? If the answer is no, it is way overvalued. Then you want to like dive in and say, well, what are the market conditions like? You know, are they changing? Is it going to be different in the future where NVIDIA is not, you know, could potentially not go higher? What about the supply and demand of these chips that they sell? What do they look like? If it's very expensive and they could run into problems, I mean, yeah, it's probably a bubble and we'll probably get a big, big size pullback in it. Now, NVIDIA, I know that the pricing on it is exceptionally high. So I wouldn't be there. I just wouldn't have money there. I would have already traded out. And somebody would say, well, you would have missed a lot of this move higher. 
Sure. That's exactly true. But look at how fast this thing fell, too. Fell like a rock uh, coming back down. So wherever things get ultra dangerous and the risks start to increase and you lose your symmetry, there's no problem just saying, I'm not going to play the game. It's exactly what I do. I don't play this game when things get expensive because that's where you can get hurt really bad. You get hurt really bad when you start playing the game of I'm going to go chase and FOMO into a stock. That's just not what I do. Now, here's Kathy Wood, ARK Invest. Uh, they have destroyed $14 billion in wealth over the past decade, Morningstar has said. These funds managed to lose value for shareholders even during a generally bullish market. And, and how did they do that? They were probably choosing stocks that don't make money. That's, that's generally where you lose money. Uh, it's the very speculative stuff that isn't cash flowing. And then they go and they speculate and it doesn't work out because investors, true investors, want cash flow. They want a return on their capital. And if the money is in a very speculative sector and speculative stocks, a lot of those things fail. And that's where you underperform is you go too speculative. Why is it important to figure out how the IEA calculated quarter four 2023 balances? Because they're missing 1.2 million barrels per day delta is what they use to extrapolate the 2024 global oil market balances. By attributing it to false reality, the IEA purposefully increases oversupply by 1.2 million barrels per day. So this oversupply doesn't really exist. It's, it's a forecast on a, on a bad model. So be careful what you're looking at. Be careful at these forecasts that some of the, these people have because the models may not be right. And these guys have been wrong a lot of the time. So be careful. So Jeff says, your house is worth $200,000 more than it was two years ago. Do you feel more rich? I don't feel anything. Uh, my house is probably up by that amount uh, over the past however many years. Um, I, I really don't care what my house is worth. I used it to lock in my um, expenses. And then I refinanced. And, and what I'm trying to do is build resiliency in my life. One of the largest expenses in my life is my mortgage or my living costs. So how can I lock in the majority of my living costs at the lowest possible cost? That's, that's a strategy. My strategy is to become more resilient over time, where I can lock in something and let inflation eat it away. So my mortgage is very low, and really the extra worth of my house is only going to take money out of my pocket through property taxes. So I would prefer my house to not really go up in value. I just have it rather go sideways and my property taxes stay low. That's what I would prefer. Uh, Sven says, I'm not selling <clears throat> until the relative strength indicator hits 150 and the price is 500% above the 200-day moving average. Uh, this is the super micro computer. This is what a bubble looks like. Generally, you get a lead-in, you get a long pause period, and then you get a big blow-off top. This is a, mo a monster blow-off top. Now, usually when it goes up this fast, it very well could go down that fast. This one, you're playing with fire, baby. You are playing with fire if you're trying to buy it up here. And this is all FOMO. This is what you want to avoid. Uh, that is SMCI is the stock. Uh, here's JC. He says, do you think this level is important or no? Just ignore it. It is important, but look at the relative strength. It is declining. And the way that I see this in a chart is you can draw a trend line through here and a trend line through the top. It's, it's squeezing up into a corner. <laughs> Another thing that I look at <clears throat> is the momentum of the stock. You're, you're extending less and less as you go up and it's starting to tire out. So if we're coming up into a, into a rising wedge and it's extending and, and, and tiring out, this is something you want to watch because if you break to the downside, you could see maybe a nasty move lower where the S&P 500 could potentially underperform technology. Uh, and that is weird. But we could see both of these also fall at this point too, because this is a ratio chart that is 
potentially very high. Oh, going lower means technology will underperform and the S&P 500 will outperform. Sorry about that. Got that backwards. S&P 500 would outperform. Sorry. And that would probably happen during a down market. Um, interviews with more than two dozen experts, along with exclusive data, public reports and regulatory filings paint the picture of a country dealing with power quality that's rapidly worsening with potentially deadly consequences. So we've got unpredictable power surges threaten the U.S. grid and your home. The U.S. power grid is struggling to maintain an even flow of electricity and putting homes at risk. And this is your renewables creating these problems. So stress on the nation's grids is accelerating in an unprecedented clip. Demand is climbing just as aging infrastructure strains under the massive overhaul needed to adapt to new renewable energy. This convergence is making it harder to maintain safe, reliable power quality. And this is the change in five-year averages for outages. You can see there's a lot of outages in some of these areas. Power quality issues likely to only get worse with larger adoption of EVs and other migration to full electrification. Lack of large-scale energy storage means supply from power plants has to be kept in balance with households and businesses every minute of the day. So that, that's the, the struggle that we're having <clears throat> with our electrical power grid and, and adopting more and more um, renewables. And at some point, we may have to stop the adoption of renewables and maybe put more baseload power in. Now, a lot of people are going to think, oh, that's going to be nuclear. Nuclear takes time, guys. It's probably going to be natural gas. That, that's going to be my guess. <clears throat> So here's another one, a quote by Benjamin, Benjamin Graham. The more you study, <clears throat> sorry guys, the more you study the top investors, the more you recognize how important it is to be able to ignore the crowd. You are neither right nor wrong because the crowd disagrees with you. You are right because your data and reasoning are right. And I resonate very well with that. Um, I am not listening to a lot of these people who are on YouTube and I'm making my own decisions. Um, we talk about this a lot on the website where, you know, this is how I see it. And then we can debate that or discuss it. Um, but, but that's where you make the most amount of money is basically dialing in your data and reasoning and then finding out what correlates with what and what does well under certain market conditions. Those are all invaluable things as you learn uh, to become a better investor. If you're, if you're an even slightly above average investor who spends less than they earn, over a lifetime, you cannot help but get rich if you are patient. Patient is what really drives wealth. Impatience is what ruins people. That's where people get very impatient and they start to FOMO in to stocks where they shouldn't be. They're chasing price performance. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a factor of not knowing what they're doing. Here's uh, Antero Resources' view of the LNG export growth with new annotations. So despite the DOE pause, we still have plus 10 billion cubic feet per day of growth of liquefied natural gas by fourth quarter of 2027. This is all in the pipeline that's already been approved and is being built. So we still have a gigantic amount of LNG capacity, takeaway capacity, uh, being built in the system. And I don't think people realize that. And this is a big move. And, and our inventory levels are extremely small in relationship to the, to the demand that is here. We need to vastly increase our inventory levels. And that's going to change the complete picture of how people view inventory. They're going to say, oh, the, the inventory level's about full, but this can drain this very quickly. It's, it's, it's not a big inventory level. Okay, so once your investment portfolio is big enough, do you actually need an emergency fund? Personally, I don't think, think you do. Once your investments cover all your living expenses, I think that is the ultimate emergency fund. Well, you're, what you're doing is you want to build resiliency into your life. So... Having enough money to cover your expenses is you probably want, you know, one to two times that at least, I would say, in a bank account ready to, to cover that. But <clears throat> you can get pretty creative if 
your expenses are very low in relationship to your income. So if you've got gobloads of free cash flow, basically, um, if your income is way greater than your expenses, so I'll, I'll give you an example. If you developed, you know, four, five, six, ten different streams of income, um, let's say you have a side business, you've got a job, and you've got monster dividends coming into your portfolio. And let's say you built it where you've got $30,000 of income per month, per month. And your, and your expenses are like five, six, seven grand. So that's 30 grand minus, let's say, five grand of expenses. You've got $25,000 that you can basically absorb stuff. That is what I consider to be resiliency. And if you have diversified ways of making that money and they're all roughly the same, if you lose a stream of income, it doesn't really impact your life because you have, you've, you've got this large buffer in the system where if you lose five grand of income or 10 grand of income and you're down to $20,000 and you're, you've got $5,000 of expenses, no big deal. It doesn't really matter. And you can still save and invest to grow that income larger if you would like. So resiliency isn't in the emergency fund. <clears throat> resiliency is building your expenses and your income, having a large buffer in that, and then diversifying your streams of income to build the resiliency in your life where basically you don't have to budget. You don't really have to do a lot of stuff. Uh, to, to make sure that you can make it every single month. That is what I consider to be resiliency in the system. Uh, the story is getting out. The forecast is now unmistakable reality. 4.8 down to 4 when oil was supposed to be, uh, to be in abundancy. Watch what happens this year and next. Then watch the panic looks like in World, uh, West Texas Intermediate. What this is, is if you draw a trend line back to 1988 and you draw this these lower um, points on this line, we've broken an uptrend and we are trending lower in our total uh, crude oil inventories. We are drawing our inventories down over time. Now, another thing to keep in mind here is it's not about just the inventory. It's about the days to coverage of that inventory. This inventory level is nothing like it was in 2004 because our demand in 2004 was much lower than it is today. I don't know the exact demand in 2004. It was probably like 80 million barrels of oil or something. And now we're over 100 million barrels of oil. So that might be a 20 million barrel of oil swing. And we're at the same inventory level. So your days of coverage is far lower today than what it was back here. So if your days of coverage remains the same, your inventories would, would continue to grow and your days of, of, of coverage would remain the same. But this here, your days of coverage are way down. And this is where problems can occur because the system is becoming less resilient. It can't handle movements in inventories as well. So if we get a really large draw and we keep drawing down, your days to cover continually declines rapidly. And again, this is both commercial and strategic reserves combined. So this is OECD crude and refined product inventories for the world. We are drawing down. Um, so here's this guy, Steve. I like this quote. He says, every place I worked, 40% were dead weight, unpromotable. 50% would barely do their jobs. 10% were high performers. It's not that hard to be in the top 10%. So I've been in every single one of these categories uh, at some point in my career. And I've been in a, when I first came in, I was a very high performer, uh, did very well. Now I didn't get gigantic pay increases. And my problem was I didn't move to different jobs fast enough. I put up with it. I thought that they would promote me. I thought that they would give me a larger merit increase. You got to start taking things into your own hands if you want more money. You, you can't stay at a company for a very long period of time uh, if they're not giving you good, basically, if they're not rewarding you for your performance. 
50% would barely do their jobs. That's what I turned into. Uh, since I wasn't getting the merit increases, uh, since they weren't promoting me as fast, and I promote, I, I got, I went to a senior engineer pretty quick, and then at a senior engineer, they are very reluctant in certain uh, sites and certain areas to promote you to a staff engineer, which is the next level up, uh, what, what they call it there. So they were reluctant to do that, but I was doing an incredibly good job. I was saving the company a buttload of money. I was working on projects that management wanted me to work on. I did everything that I was supposed to do to, to move up, but it never came. And I should have left, you know, a year or two in and just said, screw it, I'm out, and then get a big bump. Uh, that would have been a, a, a big move for, for, for pay. Um, dead weight and unpromotable. I don't know if I was ever dead weight. Um, I think I could be perceived as dead, dead weight because I could do my job so easily that I could literally just like go through the, the motions and be better than 90% of the people. So yes, I could be perceived as not trying very hard, but I would still be better than probably 99% of the people that were there because I have all this experience I could draw on. And it looked like I wasn't working very hard because I could solve problems off the top of my head. Oh, I've seen that before. Do this. Oh, I've done this. Do that. Well, we need to order this. I know the connections. I've got the people I can I can contact. It takes me two minutes. Now, if I if you were to put someone completely new or newer into that position, they would probably be crying because they don't know all those connections. And they don't really teach you how to do that. So it, it's all about perception with a lot of these managers in, in the workplace. And if that's based off perception and they're not measuring you off of objectable you know, uh, objective, quantifiable goals, drop them. Just leave. <laughs> That's the best advice I can give you. Um, here's Jesse Felder. He says, consensus bulls now match their highest level in 20 years. And whenever the sentiment gets like this, guys, time to leave. Time to leave the building. It's time to leave the stock. It's time to leave that sector. <laughs> Um, Peter says, U.S. retail sales plunged 0.8% January, the biggest monthly drop since the COVID lockdowns. Even as retail prices continue to rise, meanwhile, import and export prices both spiked 0.8%. This confirms the economy is cooling down just as inflation is heating up. This is stagflation. Get ready for it. Uh, what is the most important invention in human history? There are two most important inventions in human history. It is the car and it is plumbing. And the lifespan of people increased the most from those two, two inventions because we weren't dying of bacterial diseases from horses pooping and, and from humans pooping and basically getting on our hands and then eating it. Uh, we, were, we were dying of bacterial diseases before those two and we saw the largest increase of uh, life living, we'll, we'll call it the, the lifespan of people after those two inventions. So the car, which eliminated the horse, and plumbing, which Im eliminated the bacteria that we would catch from ourselves. Um, while the gold price can correct lower, it has never fallen below the top gold miners' cost of production, which is now at 1650 and 1700 Due to massive government money printing during pandemic shutdown, gold and silver production costs have increased significantly. So this is what's going to drive physical metals higher. It's going to be your cost curves. What you need to worry about is the price of oil. If we get into a, a, a shortage of oil, which a lot of people are projecting late 2024, 2025 is when we're going to start to go into a potential shortage. And remember, we just looked at our inventory levels drawing down. We're already running deficits. We're drawing down those inventory levels. And then when it hits a critical critical time, you're going to see, in my my guess is, you're going to see a massive move higher in oil and a very big move in interest rates to the upside. I don't think the, I don't I don't think, the Federal Reserve can do anything about it. If it's driven by oil, this is very similar to the 1970s, which only occurred in America, but we grew, our our production into the world. So we started importing more oil in the 1970s. This time, it's the entire world. So mining companies may not make more money even if the gold price goes up. They are looking at the margins of the company. They're looking at their input costs and what they can get for the commodity. And then they net the difference. If their cost curves continue to go up because, I mean, let's face it, guys, mining companies are more or less 
a conversion of energy into uh, refined products. <clears throat> it's the moving of all this stuff, refining it down and, and all that. So it's really just converting energy into a commodity, a, a metal, let's say. This, in this case, it's gold. So if energy prices spike, their cost curves will go up too. And they may or may not make more money uh, if the price of that commodity goes up. It has to go up at a faster pace than their inputs. So basically, it would be the gold price in relationship to the consumer price index, where the mining companies would do very well. And we could get that type of scenario uh, in the future if people get afraid of the potential system of bonds and currencies and people start rushing into physical metals. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip that one. <clears throat> so this is, oil rigs are now contracting the most since the pandemic issue. Keep in mind, US GDP is nearly 30% higher than pre-pandemic levels, while oil production remains at approximately the same level as it was in early 2020. And what I'm, what I'm looking at is, is this gonna be a bottom here where we start coming back up? That is what I think will occur. The best time to invest is when this, this bottoms and starts coming back up. And then we can, get, we can see uh, the additions of rigs coming back. So they're, 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 they're reducing less until we hit a positive number. I think this is going to roll back around here uh, at some point. Natural gas is a little bit iffy <laughs> uh, because of the pricing. So you might see that pull back. But I also think it could, it could recover very quickly. Uh, because the inventory levels are very small. They're not big, so they could swing very quickly. So that, that's one thing I am uh, watching. Uh, this is Investment Wisdom. He says, we do not have the faintest idea what share prices will do in the short term, nor do we think it's important for the long-term investor. A avoid the, the short-term guys. You're going to be, you're going to go, here, when I go into a stock, there's a high likelihood that I will be down on that stock in the short term. It's a very high likelihood. Catching the absolute bottom is nearly impossible of the stock. So a lot of the times I might be down 10%, 20%, 30% if it's a long-term position. And it's going to swing up and down. So what I do is I cost average in because I'm a long-term investor. I cost average in, get the lowest price possible as best as I can technically allow myself using technical analysis. And then I ride it higher using the ratios and all that other stuff that I de developed. And that's where I'm going to end it, guys. We're getting pretty long here. So um, that's what I've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website if you want. Use the word uh, LEAP in the discount coupon code if you want to learn more about investing and, and my approaches uh, to the markets. I use the three-pillar approach. Three-pillar approach is ratios, market conditions, and technical analysis. And that's what I train. <laughs> I train on those three. Um, this weekend, uh, on Saturday at 7 a.m., we have a question and answer session, and I will be covering a lot of stuff there. Uh, it deals with looking at investments, the business itself. I'll talk about the three pillars and then I'm gonna go into natural gas uh, and some of the background with that. So uh, there's a lot to talk about this weekend and hopefully we uh, have fun doing it. All right guys, that's what I've got for today. Uh, we'll catch you next time. This is Finding Value.